Hey everyone, I'm going to do a reading from uh, Mary Daly's book, Pure Lust, a uh, section that I found interesting that talked about asceticism and gave two examples of 20th century aesthetics. Um, I think it's an interesting subject to talk about because um, uh, I agree with Mary Daly where she talked about patriarchy being the um, global religion and that regardless of where you looked on the planet, the different sects of religious dogma were really just um, forms of patriarchy. And so her kind of worldview was to look to ways of uh, having a sense of spirituality that was separated from that and that dealt in actually being and living and expressing oneself. Um, and it's interesting, she talks about the the word for sin um, deriving from the word which meant to be. So basically, to sin is to be. It's an interesting way of looking at it. So I think her criticisms of this stuff is kind of interesting, especially because it tears down um, Mahatma Gandhi, who is somebody who I don't really respect very much. Um, and um, <clears throat> T. E. Lawrence. So, yeah, just sit with me and, and hear it out. I may pronounce some of the words wrong, though. And why is my computer fan going? Whatever, I'll just talk louder. You know, like you're not used to having poor sound quality with my videos sometimes, right? <laughs> anyway. It is useful to examine the cases of a few 20th century ascetic heroes which illustrate the lustful circle of apparent separation from and frenzied return to the fixations of philo sorry, philocracy. <laughs> How does she write that pronounce? Phallocracy? Okay, yeah, whatever. Mahatma Gandhi. The record of Mahatma Gandhi's ascetic practices has drawn attention in recent years. In his autobiography, Gandhi wrote of his possession by lust, by animal passion in his youth. At the, end of, or at the age of 36, having been married for 24 years, he took the vow of brahmacharya, or celibacy. He eliminated carnal relationship with women, including his wife, Kasturbai. There are strict rules to keep a brahmachari celibate. For example, he must not look at women and must avoid even eunuchs and animals. You. The Hindu doctrine behind the practice of brahmacharya is a teaching that conservation of semen or vital force is essential for physical, mental, and spiritual power. Gandhi rejected these practices, believing that the brahmachari who, had de who really had developed self-control could mingle freely with women. He still had problems, however, and tried to resolve them by fasting, obsessing over foods, supposedly responsible for his animal passion. In order, it seems, to prove himself that he had overcome his obsessions, he is said to have engaged in his famous, or rather infamous, experiments in brahmacharya. These were described by Nirmal Kumar Bose, who is cited by Ved Mehta as follows. He sometimes asked women to share his bed and even the cover which he used. And then he tried to ascertain if even the least trace of sensual feeling had been evoked in himself or his companion. Sometimes he would awaken with shivering fits and ask the woman sleeping next to him to hold him. According to Ved Mehta, toward the ends of his life, Gandhi was con still continuing this practice and explained it with such religious legitimations as the following. When the gopis, milkmaids, were stripped of their clothes by Krishna, the legend says, they showed no sign of embarrassment or sex consciousness, but stood before the Lord in rapt, emphasis mine, devotion. Gandhi was unable to perceive the obscenity of this ideal of purity. The idea that these women were being raped spiritually was completely negated. He denied that he was using the women with whom he slept in order to prove his seminal continence. Gandhi was doing this at the age of 77. Orthodox Hindus condemned him for his unorthodox brahmacharya practices, such as his long daily baths and massages, often administered by girls, and his daily walks with his hands on the shoulders of girls. The fact is, however, that Gandhi simply carried through the logic inherent in brahmacharya, affirming that to be truly successful, one would have to have close but asexual affinity with women. Thus he did not flee from women physically, only to be obsessed with fantasies. 
Rather, he increased the illusion of mental flight by intensifying physical proximity. What is really going on here is an enormous draining of women's energies into the phallocentric cesspool. One must ask what Gandhi received from the women when he asked them to hold him naked in the night. Clearly it was something not attainable from men. One of the women who slept with him in this manner was interviewed and admitted that her husband did mind her sleeping with Gandhi and then got to the latter, offering his own body in place of hers. He, her husband, said that he had more vitality, more energy, was healthier all around. Gandhi knew better and kept the woman to prove that he was as free from lustful thoughts as he was from physical desire. Eric Erickson gives a convoluted explanation of such behavior expressing it or interpreting it as an expression of Gandhi's maternalism. Gandhi had wanted to purify his relationship to his father by nursing and mothering him, and he had wanted to be an immaculate mother. But when, at the end, he was defeated in his aspiration to be the founding father of the United India, he may well have needed maternal solace himself. Erickson even says that in this expression of maternalism, Gandhi was living and wondering out loud about a multiformity of inclinations which other men hide and bury in strenuous consistency. It is necessary to cut through the stereotype of motherhood that beclouds the thinking of Gandhi, Bose, Erickson, etc., and notice the blatant clues here. Gandhi wanted something which he recognized as female, but which he could neither name accurately nor possess in himself. He was not at all unusual in his attempts to tap into female energy sources. T. E. Lawrence, another 20th century ascetic hero, was T. E. Oh, sorry, <laughs> was T. E. Lawrence. Lawrence's obsessive self-punishment was even more spectacular than Gandhi's obsessive self-testing. Yet the very title of a recent biography, A Prince of Our Disorder, unmasks a secret similarity between Lawrence and other men. The author John E. Mack asserts that Lawrence's flagellation disorder was distinct from the commonplace practices of flagellation by individuals for erotic pleasure. Mack describes Lawrence's disorder as rare, the self-determined use of flagellation for personal penance. Yet he manages to interpret this behavior as quite in keeping with the tradition of early saints who used such methods to subdue sexual thoughts and cravings. And people wonder why I'm <laughs> critical of S and M. Max information about Lawrence refuses refutes his own deceptive distinction between penance and the erotic pleasure as associated with flagellation. He recounts the bizarre exploits of the, his ascetic hero, who during the last years of his life invented a fictitious uncle, who decided that this nephew Ted should be flogged periodically with a metal whip. Under the pseudonym of this uncle, Lawrence wrote letters to a man named John Bruce, whom he hired to administer these beatings to Ted, Lawrence himself, giving instructions about details. One of the requirements was that the beatings be delivered on the bare buttocks. It was also required that they be severe enough to produce a seminal emission. Wow! <laughs> Ted regularly visited Bruce to receive his beatings. In his role as uncle, his true identity allegedly was not known by the unsuspecting Bruce, who believed that Ted was being punished for a financial fraud. Lawrence wrote a number of letters to Bruce, asking for the details of how the lad was taking his punishment. These beatings took place at intervals over a period of almost ten years. Before quoting some of the uncle's letters, Mac remarks that these reveal his bitter hostility towards himself, his profound self-contempt, his wish to know his own reactions, and finally, a pathetic desire for some vindicating judgment that would free him of the conflict. He was, in fact, never freed of the conflict. In Mack's analysis, Lawrence was punishing himself for his sexual surrender when he was raped by the Turks at Dara, a surrender motivated by fear of pain. He believed that he had not only surrendered sexually, but he had given away the fundamental integrity of self. Most horrifying to him was the fact that he found the mingling of sexual assault and pain to be pleasurable. He wrote to Mrs. Shaw at the, that at the time he felt a delicious warmth swelling through me. Mac theorizes, The traumatic intensity of the experience, with its overwhelming of psychic defenses, led to the permanent welding for Lawrence of sexual pleasure and pain, so that he was plagued not only by the memory of the incident, but by the continuous desire for its repetition. Lawrence was caught in a vicious circle. 
The only punishment sufficiently severe to allay the guilt, according to Mack's interpretation, included the repetition of the experience itself, the pain of the beatings. However, this in turn required a repetition of the sexual aspect of the experience, thereby deepening the guilt. As in the case of Gandhi, Lawrence was continually testing himself, attempting to purify himself. As with Gandhi, his tests were self-imposed and highly ritualistic, and he identified with patriarchally constructed feminine roles. In Gandhi's case, the role was motherliness. For Lawrence, the role was that of rape victim who feels trapped in a sense of defilement and false guilt. Gandhi's circle was less self-destructive. He physically raped women, many of whom he addressed, whom addressed him as mother. At the same time, he conned them into behaving behaving toward him in a maternal way. He got the best of both deals, receiving not only the respect due to a male mother, but also the mothering, as in the spiritual nurturance, the energy injections, which he recognized women alone as capable of bestowing. Millions adored this imposter mother, an image which has served even the scandal of the brahmacharya experiments. Lawrence fared differently. He was also legendary, and his fame was not destroyed by the revelations in the Sunday Times of his peculiar ascetic practices, but his life ended in self-destruction. A crucial difference relevant to this outcome came from the fact that Lawrence was not sexually attracted to women. Mack writes, I believe Lawrence could not have allowed himself to be beaten by a woman. The masochism of many men does take this form. For the beatings, perverse, brutal, and pathetic as they may seem, are nevertheless a form of closeness selected for the fusion of intimacy and simultaneous desecration they represent. Lawrence was generally more comfortable with closeness among men, and could tolerate perhaps a perverse form of intimacy with certain men in a way that he could never have tolerated with a woman. Unlike the male who pays prostitutes to beat him, Lawrence was not able to drain energy so directly from females who could recycle his psychic waste. He paid torturer, his paid torturer lacked this capacity. He found himself trapped in the male-created image of the rape victim who is driven to come back for more, which is, a, which is classic patriarchal femininity. Max suggests that perhaps he was forced in dealing with his conflicts to squander a certain amount of psychic energy. Thus, his horizons were specifically limited by his personal conflicts. Both Gandhi and Lawrence lived out their lust-filled flights from lust in male-made feminine roles. The Hindu mother is generally praised and his shortcomings overlooked. The Christian male rape victim, who strangely resembled a nun in his white Arab robes, is perceived by his biographers as an unquestionably great, but also as pathetic. He is seen as a tragic victim of a disorder, which according to Mack was due largely to his powerful identification with his mother, who used to beat him. It is perfectly consistent with the phallocentric ethic that men who live through the most limit of their capability, the feminine roles which men have created, should be honored as slightly flawed divinities. Gandhi was a mother who did not succeed in his efforts to be mother of united India, but he was revered as no genuine mother has ever been revered during her lifetime in patriarchal history and certainly honored as no self-identified creative woman has ever been honored. As for Lawrence, this prince of our disorder is eulogized as tragic for falling into an imitation of the vicious circle which has been the common fate of countless women. This is the circle of those victims of rape who never break out because their spirits as well as their bodies have been torn apart and the only healing offered has been a hideous welding of pleasure and pain. Of course, the fate of Lawrence is mourned as tragic. While a far more hopeless fate is accepted and legitimized by the psychiatrists and priests of Sado spirituality as the natural and divinely ordained fate of women.